Waalaikum salam. Waalaikum salam. All right. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah uh, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So alhamdulillah we are um, just at the beginning of the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Uh, tonight is the 21st night. So this is the first uh, of the odd nights and the first uh, the beginning of the last 10 nights. And we see Subhanallah, just it seems like as if it was uh, yesterday that we were preparing for Ramadan, right? We were uh, worried about masjid being closed, uh, this coronavirus outbreak, how are we going to do uh, Ramadan this year? We were all worried about this. And now, Subhanallah, we find ourselves, uh, it's almost over. And this is actually a hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said and uh, it's collected in Sahih Al-Bukhari and it's a narration from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was giving a few signs of the hour. لا تقوم الساعة حتى The hour will not be established until a few things happen. In this one particular hadith he gave like about three or four examples and there's of course uh, lots of hadith. Lots of ahadith that talk about what's going to happen before, uh, as we get closer and closer to uh, Yawmul Qiyamah. So in this particular hadith, he mentioned that one of the signs of the hour approaching is, وَيَتَقَارَبَ zaman. وَيَتَقَارَبَ zaman. Time will pass by very quickly. And no doubt, we see this in our times, in this generation, us living. It's like literally, just it seemed like a few hours ago, that we were preparing for Ramadan to start, and now we find ourselves in the last uh, 10 days, 10 nights of Ramadan. All right, so of course, it is what it is. This is the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot go against uh, His will. We cannot go against the structure that He has made life with. But we, if we are wise, we can maximize the benefit. So inshallah ta'ala, tonight's, uh, the point of tonight's lecture is, since it is the first, is the beginning of the last 10 nights, let us remind ourselves about how to maximize uh, the reward bi'idhnillah during these last uh, few nights. Now of course, um, over the months, over the years, if you've been fasting for a long time, but if you're a new Muslim, if this was your first Ramadan, uh, whatever may be the case, but you have most likely heard such statements from the Prophet ﷺ a few times, like the hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, and others, or, or let's say just take Sahih al-Bukhari itself. In it, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانْ مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانْ مَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ Whoever fasts in Ramadan, whoever, there's another narration, whoever stands the night prayer in Ramadan, Another narration that says, whoever stands the night prayer during Laylatul Qadr, imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama bin dhanbihi. With sincere iman and sincere hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then ghufira lahu ma taqaddama bin dhanbihi. Allah will forgive him or her sins, whatever came before that Ramadan. 
So that is the whole point that we لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The fasting has been prescribed so that perhaps you can attain taqwa. The night prayers have been established it's all throughout the year and especially in the month of Ramadan so that you can earn forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we know fasted nine Ramadans because the obligation of fasting Ramadan it was sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in second hijri and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died 11th hijri so he had nine Ramadans so nine times he had the privilege or the ummah had the privilege to see to read about how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would spend the days of ramadan the nights of ramadan and the last 10 days 10 nights of ramadan so before getting into some of those pointers let's see from the quran itself allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr indeed we have sent this, meaning the Qur'an, down in the night of Al-Qadr. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ This Qur'an was sent down in Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, the meaning why it's called Laylatul Qadr, because this is the night of decree. This is how we translate it in English. Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree. It is called Laylatul Qadr because... This is a night which obviously occurs in the month of Ramadan, not some other time. Like in Sha'ban, we, there's a huge bid'ah that in the subcontinent they do. They celebrate that Shab-i Barat, the biggest night of the year. The biggest night of the year is not 15th of Sha'ban. The most important night of the year is Laylatul Qadr. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the Sunnah. So it is called Laylatul Qadr. This is the night uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an. It's in the month of Ramadan. And this is the night, Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree. This is called the night of decree because in this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down His decree for the coming year, for all of His creation. What's going to happen for the coming year until the next Laylatul Qadr, which is next year, Ramadan. So the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, this is just, I'm not, the, the topic of tonight's discussion is not about the belief in al-qadr wal qadr, the divine decree, a predest predestination, which is the sixth pillar of iman, the sixth pillar of faith in Islam. But briefly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees matters in five different levels or five different, uh, uh, five different times. The first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created the pen, right? He created the pen, everything has been written, and this was 50,000 years before anything was created. The pen wrote everything from that day until the day of resurrection. And that book is called Al Lawhul Mahfuz, the prescribed tablet. It is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the decisions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is written in that book. And as Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Allahul Mahfuz, it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fawq al arsh, above his arsh. It's with him. So this was the first decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, Allah made a divine decree after the creation of our father Adam alayhi salam. And this is mentioned in Surah A'raf, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, from his loins, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought out the dhurriyat, all the children uh, of Adam alayhi salam that was going to come from that day till the day of judgment. And Adam alayhi salam asked, who are these people? Allah told him, these are your children. And Allah asked everyone a question. Am I not your Lord? Everyone said, Bala, yes. This is why you find someone who is an atheist today, someone who claims to be an atheist. There is no way he or she can run away from saying things like, oh God, but then say, no, I don't really be, it's just an expression. No, it's stamped in your heart. Or even if they are atheists, they will say, Mother Nature, Father Time. They attribute 
divinity to some type of made up concept because it's stamped in our hearts. We have to believe in a supreme being. We have to believe in a higher authority. So Allah made that a decree and took that covenant from all of us, all of Bani Adam after the creation of Adam alayhi salam. And then of course they were split. The people on the right were from uh, Ashabul Yameen, the people on the right, they are the people of Jannah from the children of Adam alayhi salam. And on the left, they were the people of uh, Jahannam from the children of Adam alayhi salam. The third time is the lifetime decree. And this we uh, mentioned, uh, or uh, it's narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, on the 120th day of pregnancy, a malak is sent, and the malak writes down four things. Whether it's a boy or girl, uh, whether uh, how long the person will live, what type of uh, risk the person will uh, earn, and whether the person will be a person of Jannah or a person of Jahannam. This is the lifetime decree. Then the yearly decree, this is number four. The yearly decree happens in Laylatul Qadr. And the fifth and final one is the daily decree. So these are the five different stages where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees matters, right? These are the five different places or times or situations. So we are now about to face the yearly decree, the moment of yearly decree. This is what Laylatul Qadr is, the night of decree. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees his verdicts, his commands. All the malaika in the heavens and the earth, they listen and they record. All right, so let's say uh, the angels are, there's a guy called John. He's going to suffer a disease three months from now in this year. Okay, there's another person called Muhammad. He's going to have a car accident within this year. Okay, uh, there's a person called Fatima. She's going to get married to a very nice uh, man, right? Whatever it is, it's uh, uh, everything is written for what's going to happen for, the rem for this next year. This is why this night is so important. The decree from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down in this night. So, inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Indeed, in this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Quran. This is similar to another ayah in the Quran in Surah Dukhan, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, inna anzalnahu fi laylatim mubarakah. Indeed, we sent it, the Quran, down on a blessed night, Laylatim Mubaraka, a night filled with Baraka, a night filled with blessings. Inna kunna mundirin. Indeed, we are ever warning mankind. So this is a night of Baraka. It is a night of decree. It is a night of Baraka. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ The month of Ramadan is, is the month in which the Qur'an was sent down. Qur'an, what is this Qur'an? هُدًا للناس. It is a guidance for mankind. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ And it is, uh, it's a guidance for mankind, it's a clarification, clear proofs and a criterion between right and wrong. So in this month, in this time, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an all at one time from Allah al-Mahfuz to Baytul Izzah, which is the house of might in, uh, in the Sama al-Dunya, in the lowest heaven. And that was sent down, the entire Qur'an was sent down in one night. From Allah al mahfuz to Sama al dunya From there, Jibreel alayhi salam came down over 23 years and brought those verses to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. So is this clear? Because some people, you might be confused. Wait a minute. The Quran was revealed over 23 years. Some verses were revealed in Muharram. Another verse was revealed in Dhul Hijjah. Another verse was revealed in Sha'bad. Not everything was revealed in Ramadan. That's not what Allah is talking about in these verses. From Allah al mahfuz to Sama al dunya it was all sent down in one night. From there, Jibreel alayhi salam brought the verses to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam over 23 years. Right? So inshallah ta'ala, this is uh, clear. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnified the status of Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, uh, which he chose for the revelation of this mighty Quran. This is of course, a, 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 I mean, this is the night in which the entire Quran came down to Sama al dunya It's not something to take lightly, brothers and sisters. This is a huge, huge night. It's of utmost importance to us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in Surah Qadr, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ What will and what will make you understand what Laylatul Qadr is? Allah is asking us a question. He first tells us, indeed, in this night, the Qur'an was sent down. Then he's asking, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ It's like, how can I explain to you or make you understand how important this night is? And what will make you understand or know what the night of Qadr is? This is not a night that people should take lightly. Words cannot describe the importance of this night. Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr. Then Allah says, just to somewhat explain to us the ones who are thinking, the ones who are awake, and are they take heed from Allah's statements, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr. This night is better for you than alfi shahr, than 1,000 months. One night is better than a thousand nights. It's not that Allah said it is equal to a thousand nights. خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ It is better. It is better than a thousand nights. What is a thousand nights? Eighty-three years and four months. People don't even live that long. People don't even live that long. A lot of us from Bani Adam don't live to see eighty-three years and four months. However, this one night is better than 83 years and four months of your life. Sometimes people ask, and I'm just going off a tangent here. I want to live long. No, none of us want to die, right? When we think of death, uh, we get scared. We don't want to die. Already, even if somebody's like 90 years old, he doesn't want to die. I mean, how much of the dunya you want to see? You've, you've seen it for 90 years. It's, it's still hideous the day you were born. And it's going to be hideous, more hideous after you die. How much longer you want to see. But if it's for a good cause that let me live long so I can worship you, Allah, that's great. That is the intention that a Muslim is supposed to have. Allah, give me life. And we covered this, remember, right before Ramadan uh, happened, uh, during our COVID-19 lockdown, one of the lectures I gave was that Allah is the t giver and the taker of life. So it's from the sunnah, Allah, that you don't wish for death. You don't wish for death. However, you ask Allah, give me long life if it is better for me. But if death is better for me, then give me death. What does it mean? If living longer is going to help me go to Jannah, then give me life. However, if living shorter is going to help me go to Jannah, then take my life. You leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyways, people want to live longer, live longer. But from the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and from the Qur'an itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given ideas, has put forth concepts that if a believer truly pays attention, he and she can definitely live longer. Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, for example, one salah in, in Mecca, in, in Masjid al-Haram is... A hundred thousand salawat elsewhere. So let's say you have been blessed. You made Umrah. You made Hajj. Or you had the chance to live there for some time. One salah. Every salawat that you're attending in Al-Haram. Al al it's equal to a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. So let's say you stayed there for two weeks. Two months. Five years. And you were praying five times a day in the Kaaba. At the Kaaba. How much salawat did you earn in your life? Think. Allah and His Rasul وسلم, has given us ideas. Even though we may not live to be a hundred years old. But He has given us ideas and opportunities where you can worship Him as if you lived that long. That's one example. 
So I don't want to make this tangent of a note longer. Back to the topic in hand. Similarly, one night, khairum min al shahr is better for you than 83 years and four months. So if you pray during Laylatul Qadr, it's as if you have prayed for more than 83 years. And you won't even, Allah knows best, we may not even live to see 83 years. If you read Quran in the night of Laylatul Qadr, it's as if you have been reading Quran for more than 83 years. When you give charity in Laylatul Qadr, it's as if you have been giving charity for more than 83 years. Whatever ibadah that you do in these last nights, brothers and sisters, and of course, if you are continuously worshipping Allah from tonight until it ends, for sure you will find Laylatul Qadr. If you're doing the ibadah every single night, don't just wait. Ah, oh, which night is Laylatul Qadr? Okay, khalas, I'm going to go back to sleep. You do it every single night. So that regardless of which night it is, you have fulfilled and you have been in the list of those who have worshipped Allah for more than 83 years. You have to be smart. There's no shortcuts to Jannah. Allah gives us enough shortcuts by telling us this, that hey, worship me this one night, it's equal or better than 83 years and four months. This is how you live long. You want to live longer? The Muslim maximizes these type of opportunities. Look, if you fast the month of Ramadan, followed it up with the six days of Shawwal, it's as if you are fasting every single day for an entire year. You have lived longer, even though you're not fasting, but it's considered that you have fasted the entire year. So a believer, sure, you cry for life, but this is how you are able to live longer as a Muslim. Do those ibadat at the best times so that you can maximize the time that you have in this dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sorry, in a hadith in an nasai in the Musnad of Ahmed and others, from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said, Atakum, atakum Ramadanu shahrun mubarak. Ramadan, the month of Ramadan has come to you. It is a blessed month. فَرَضَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ صِيَامَهُ in this month, Allah has ob uh, ob obliga uh, obligated the siyam, the fasting. In this month, the doors of Jannah are open and the doors of Jahannam are closed. And every strong shaitan is locked up for this entire year. I mean month, for this entire month. The strong shayateen are locked up. لِلَّهِ فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ In it is a night. In it, is a, uh, in it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a night which is better than a thousand months. Whoever is deprived of its goodness is deprived of its uh, goodness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's go back to Surah Al-Qadr. Allah then says, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرِ In this night, the angels descend. مَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا The angels, Malaika are all the angels. الروح is Jibreel alayhi salam. روح القدس, this is the title of Jibreel alayhi salam, as Allah mentioned in the Quran. So here, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا The angels and Jibreel alayhi salam, they, بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرِ They come with the commands, the decree of the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They come down with the decrees of Allah. The Prophet, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Dukhan, فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ In this night, is decreed every matter of ordainments. Amran min indina inna kunna mursilin. The command or this Quran or the decree of every matter, it comes down from us, and indeed we are ever sending the messengers. Rahmatan min rabbik innahu huwa sami'ul alim. It is a mercy from your Lord, 
and Allah is the all hearing and all knowing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing this night. The angels, they descend in abundance during the night of Qadr due to its abundant blessings. And the angels, they descend with barakah, with rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with blessings and mercy. Just as they descended when the Qur'an, uh, or descend when the Qur'an is recited. This is from other hadith, like in Sahih Muslim and others. Whenever a believer is reciting Qur'an, the angels descend and they cloud over him. They spread their wings. Not just the Qur'an. Whenever a group of people, believers, are making the dhikr of Allah, and the dhikr of Allah is not what some people do. They sit in circles and they're chanting, Allah, Allah, Allah. And then some people will say, who, who, who. This is, you're just barking. You're not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any type of dhikr, like right now, this is the dhikr of Allah. You're sitting in the house with your family, you, your wife, your children. The Inshallah ta'ala, you're doing this sincerely. The angels are hovering over your heads spread with their wings spread out. Asking Allah to bless you and have mercy on you because you're busy learning your religion. You're busy learning about Allah. You're busy learning the sunnah. It's the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anytime believers gather like this, they sit, whether and the best dhikr is the Qur'an, or you're learning uh, Islam, you're listening to a lecture, reading a book, whatever it is that's considered the dhikr of Allah, anytime you're doing this, the angels, they descend, they hover over your head. We don't see them, but they are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, invoking Allah to shower Allah's barakah and rahmah upon us. So in this night, this happens even more so than usual days of the year, usual nights. Min kulli amr, every matter, every single thing that is determined, the provision of the person, the times of death, the winners, the losers, what's going to happen, who's going to get married, who's going to get divorced, who's going to have a son, who's going to have a daughter, who's going to have... Nothing, whatever it is, every min kulli amr, every single decision is sent down during this night. Salamun hiya hatta matala'il fajr. Salam, there is peace, there is tranquility until fajr, uh, the appearance of fajr. So throughout this entire night, it is filled with peace, filled with barakah, filled with rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it stays until the Fajr time. There is absolutely no evil around. Shayateen are not around this night. The angels are. They're descending all over the world, flocking. We don't know the number. Flocking. Descending for by Allah's command with every decree until the break of dawn. In the hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed, the Prophet ﷺ said, and it's narrated by Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu anhu, Laylatul Qadri fil Ashri al Bawaki. The Laylatul Qadr happens during the last ten nights of Ramadan. Man qamahun nabati ga a hisbati hinna fa inna laha yagfiru laha lahu mata qaddama min than bihi wa mata akhar. Whoever stands during these last nights stands for what? Stands in Salah. So whoever stands during these last 10 nights in Salah, seeking their reward, then indeed Allah will forgive that person for the sins that have come, preceded him until that year. And what is about to follow, the sins that are about to follow. وَهِيَ لَيْلَةُ وِتْرِ And it is an odd night. تِسْعِينَ أَوْ سَبْعِينَ وَخَامِسَةٍ أَوْ ثَالِثَةٍ أَوْ آخِرِ لَيْلَةٍ It is an odd night. It could be the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, or the last night, which is the 29th. So the Prophet ﷺ did not specify. And there are a hadith in, uh, collected um, in the books of a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, uh, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, and Nisa'i. It has been collected. The Prophet ﷺ said that Laylatul Qadr is, in the la is an odd night in the last 10 nights. It could be the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, and the 29th. And in the hadith in the Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, it changes from year to year. So let's suppose, for hypothetically speaking, last year it was the 23rd. This year will be a different night. Right? So it changes from year to year. Unfortunately, what happens culturally speaking, in a lot of Muslim countries, they keep thinking 27th night, 27th night, 27th night. 
They have the special uh, stuff going on in the 27th night. I remember when I was growing up, so many f fairy tales that you hear, fake stuff, right? Fake news. <laughs> we didn't have to wait for Donald Trump to coin this t term, fake news. We had fake news <laughs> for so long when it came to religious matters. So anyways, fake news that people will say, even if you didn't fast the all of Ramadan, just fast the 27th. It'll suffice. If you, if you didn't pray anything, just pray the 27th night. It will suffice. So they make things up. And then you find people, they celebrate their 27th night the way that they have culturally been taught. And then they go back to sleep and they start partying. But you still have a few days of Ramadan left. You have the 28th, you have the 29th, and possibly the 30th. You have two or three more days of Ramadan left. So you want to finish with sin. That's not a good sign. That is not the sign of a successful believer. That they focus on the 27th and then the remaining, remaining two or three days, they party like crazy. So what did they do? They finished Ramadan in sin. That's terrible. That is terrible. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to make us among the foolish. The Laylatul Qadr is in any one of the witr, odd nights during this last 10 nights. Tonight is the 21st. It could be Laylatul Qadr. Or it could be the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, or 29th. This is what we have from the proven sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, Hiya fi kulli Ramadan. Every single Ramadan, this Laylatul Qadr happens in one of the odd nights. And our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrated the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تَحَرَّأُوا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ فِي الْوِتْرِ مِنَ مِنَ الْعَشْرِ الْأَوَاخِرِ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ Search for Laylatul Qadr in one of the odd nights during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So we have numerous ahadith which clearly say it is any one of the odd nights during the last 10 nights, and it is not just the 27th night, as many people have culturally made up. And then they don't do anything, the beginning of Ramadan or at the end. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to uh, wake up his family. As again, another hadith from our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, and this is a narration from Sunan Ibn Majah and others. إِذَا دَخَلَتِ الْعَشْرُ أَحْيَ اللَّيْلَ وَشَدَّ الْمِئْزَارَ وَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ When the last 10 days of Ramadan began, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would stay up at night. He would tighten his izar, meaning, of course, in the nights of Ramadan, for those of us who are married, as Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, we are allowed to be intimate with our spouses. No problem in the nighttime of Ramadan. However, during the last 10 nights of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ would step up his game, would worship Allah even more. So he would tie his izar. This is an expression. It's a nice expression saying he would refrain from being intimate with his spouses. And he would wake up his family. So brothers and sisters, from tonight, make sure you are awake. And of course, see, there's a, everything is a blessing in disguise. So many people were complaining. How are we going to do Ramadan, the COVID-19 lockdown? We can't go to the masjid. We can't do this. Well, check this out. If everything was normal, like in other years before, you would have have to go to work eight in the morning. But now your workplace is probably closed too. Alhamdulillah. Perhaps this Ramadan, you can actually stay awake all night long during the last 10 nights, worship Allah with your family, and not have to rush to work. This is a blessing in disguise. This is the bless, best blessing that you could have hoped for during the last 10 nights. Right? SubhanAllah, it is a tremendous blessing. Don't be sad. Look at the positives. So please, follow this sunnah, brothers. And this is our mother Aisha saying, the Prophet, the man of the house, he stayed up and he made sure his wife, 
His family is waking up. So I'm talking to the brothers. Tonight and the remainder of these last 10 nights, stay awake at night. Uh, pray. Read Quran. Make dua. Uh, make dhikr. Whatever it is, the different forms of worship. I'm not saying you pray. If you want, you want to stand in salah for the next six hours, that's between you and Allah. If you can do that, alhamdulillah. But is it uh, necessary that you do that? No, it's not. You want to pray for half an hour, one hour, whatever that you are physically capable of? Pray. Then read some Quran. Then just make dua. Then just say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, Wahdahu la sharika lah, Lahu al mulk, Walahu al hamd, Wahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Just keep making the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Utilize the entire night through different activities. And you can go online to mcosj.com during these last 10 nights and click the donate button and please, you know, with your hands wide open, give charity to our masjid or to any other masjid or to any other righteous cause, right? Do this. Do acts of charity during these last 10 nights, reading Quran, praying, dua, dhikr. Basically, my point is, brothers and sisters, if you are smart, you can break down, let's say our lecture, of course, inshallah, even during these last 10 nights, just like the whole Ramadan, we will have a lecture bi idnillah until 10, 10, 15, whatever may be the case. After that, you want to take a little break, drink some more, eat some more, then, uh, you know, pray Aisha. Of course, you have time to pray Aisha or after the lecture, pray Aisha. Take a little break, eat something, drink something, pray, pray some of the Qiyam. Or you want to wait until almost time for Sahura, half an hour, 45 minutes, hour before Sahur, you want to pray your Qiyam, that's the best time. So after that, what can you do? Read Quran, make some dua, give some charity, right? Online charity is open. Go to some websites, go to this, this, that. You don't have to necessarily go out in the middle of the night. If you would like to do that, you know poor Muslims in your community, you want to get out at 1.30 a.m., you know the brother or sister's house address, you want to slip in an envelope under the door, wallahi, this is something amazing. If any one of you want to do it, go ahead and do it. No problem. That you know a fellow Muslim in your community is struggling. Let me go in the middle of the night. No one is seeing me except Allah. Let me go slip in some money underneath the door of that brother or sister. Right? This is amazing. And I know people who do that, who have done that. So this is not something that you might think, oh, what is this, Batman or Robin Hood time going on? These are real people. Much better than Batman and Robin Hood. Right? These are people who follow the sunnah of the companions. Didn't Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu go in the midst of the night to go help a blind old woman right after Fajr and still dark, no one seeing? He would go in secret to help out a woman who was old and blind. And Umar wanted to do this. He wanted to see where Abu Bakr is going. He noticed that he leaves somewhere. Where is he going? Where is he going? Let me follow. Let me see. So Abu Bakr, he left. Then he went into the house. He saw that there was a house and he went, went in. He saw that there's an old woman who's blind. He's like, what's happening? He's like, I don't know. Somebody comes, cleans up my house, cooks for me and he leaves. He's like, do you know who he is? And the old woman was like, no, I can't see. I don't know who he is. So subhanallah. And that's when Umar realized there is no way I can ever catch up with Abu Bakr. It's useless. There's no point trying. They used to compete. This is the com competition that is allowed in Islam. Not the competition of destruction, which we see in our communities. One Muslim is thinking of destroying the Muslim community. Another Muslim will do him better. He will destroy the community quicker and in a worse way. That's not what the Sahaba used to do. They would compete with each other. Who can earn the pleasure of Allah? So when Umar saw this from Abu Bakr, he realized there is no way I can catch up with this man. No way. So be like that. Do acts of charity, acts of kindness during these last 10 nights. Break down your night uh, schedule. From this time to this time, I want to pray. From this time to this time, I want to read Quran. From this time to this time, I'm going to make dua. From this time to this time, whatever it is, 50 cents every night, I want to give $1 to a cause or $10 or $15. Every single night you're giving something. Break it down. Be wise. 
this is how you maximize your uh, time during these last 10 nights. Then Aisha radiallahu anha in another hadith, and this is collected in Bukhari and Muslim, in, uh, in An Nasa'i, in Ibn Majah, in the Musnad of Ahmed. When Qultu uh, Ya Rasulullah, Aisha radiallahu anha asked our messenger, Ara'ayta in alim tu ayya laylatin laylatul qadr, ma aqulu fiha. If I am aware that the night is the night of Qadr, what should I say in this night? The Prophet ﷺ taught her, and through teaching her, taught all of us until the day of resurrection, Quli, say in that night, the absolute best dua that you can make, brothers and sisters. The absolute best dua that you can make during these last 10 nights. This is what the Prophet ﷺ taught our mother Aisha. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. O Allah, you are the pardoner and you love to pardon. So pardon me. Pardon you from what? From your sins. Pardon you from Jahannam and grant you Jannah. This is the absolute best dua that you can make during these last 10 nights. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. Right? So this is the best dua that you can make. You want to make other duas? No problem whatsoever. But do not miss what the Prophet taught is the best thing that you can say. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So say this dua. Repeat it as many times as you want. Say it every single night so that you know for sure whichever night was Laylatul Qadr, my dua, I said this dua, and inshallah it is accepted. Don't focus on when is it. Focus on how you are spending that night. If you are doing these daily acts or nightly acts every single night, rest assured you have found Laylatul Qadr. Right? I mean, what, what do you have to lose? You worship Allah extra hard during these last 10 nights. Do all these things, salah, Quran, dua, dhikr, charity. You're doing them every single night during these last 10 nights. For sure, one of those nights was Laylatul Qadr. For sure, one of those nights was equal or better than 83 years and 4 months. So be smart, be wise in the way you approach. The other du'as, you make du'a for your children, make du'a for your spouse, make du'a for your marriage, uh, make du'a for yourself and your whole family. To be granted Jannah, to be saved from the fire, right? If you're sub, if you are sick, ask Allah to cure you. If you know anybody who's sick, ask Allah to cure them. So these are some general du'as. You want to make the du'a in Urdu, Bengali, Chinese, French, whatever mother tongue is you belong to. No problem. Go ahead, make your du'a in that language if that will help you be more. Uh, have more khushu, meaning more attention and concentration, no problem. But if you do know the du'as in Arabic, then say them in Arabic because this would be the best way. If you know and know their meaning, of course, that's what I meant. So say it in that. And of course, this du'a, Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni. That, oh Allah, you are the pardoner, you love to pardon, so pardon me. So this is the way, brothers and sisters, you want to maximize uh, your reward for these last 10 nights. Break it down, as I said. Salah, Quran, Dua, Dhikr, and Charity. These are the acts of ibadat that you should be focused on and set some nightly goals. Repeat the same duas every night so that for sure one of those nights was Laylatul Qadr and your dua got accepted. So what are the duas? You have this dua. You want to ask for Jannah. You want to be saved from Jahannam. You make dua for your children. You make dua for your own marriage. Right? If you are not married, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you uh, guys and girls good spouses in the coming year. If you are of that age. right? If, if you're 12 years old and making dua for a marriage, you're most likely not ready. But if you're 20, 25, 30, definitely that is the age you should be uh, getting married at, inshallah ta'ala. So make dua, whatever it is that you are in need of. This is the time you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more 
try extra hard. All right. So before we go to the questions, just a couple of minutes, a humble request from, uh, from me to all of you. Brothers and sisters, this is the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And of course, we have understood the importance of this night. We have understood, inshallah ta'ala, the benefit of worshiping Allah during these nights, the benefit of making dua during these last 10 nights. And I humbly request, right? This is, I know I have viewers from other cities, countries even, alhamdulillah. It's uh, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more people watch these lectures later on who are, don't have the time at this very moment to tune in live. So it's not for them. Uh, but of course, whatever troubles and uh, trials you guys are going through in your respective countries and cities, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve you of your pains, relieve these diseases, relieve these war-torn situations, the calamities that the Muslim ummah is facing in different parts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the victory back to Islam and raise the honor of Muslims. We all hope for that, right? Now specifically for our community, us in South Jersey, Make extra dua, sincere, sincere dua, brothers and sisters, for your own community. We had really bad past. It's not hidden. It's not something that we can deny and think, uh, just go to sleep and one day wake up, it's all gone. Life does not work that way. Every single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands from us, commanded us, it requires effort. Even this, you don't just sit at home and just make a dua and that's it. No, follow it up with salah, with reading the Quran, with charity, actions, actions, actions. You don't just say, oh Allah, save us. And then you do nothing to bring that safety from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not work that way. Look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Did Allah come, send Jibreel? Jibreel takes his finger and touches the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and wham! He memorized the entire Qur'an? No. Jibreel came, grabbed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Iqra, Iqra, Iqra. You have to take action. Say it. Read. Right? Read. And he's like, I don't know what to read. What are you telling me? Iqra. Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who has created you. The Prophet ﷺ had to take action. So if the Prophet of Allah had to take action, then definitely you and I simply cannot wish. As Imam Ibn Qayyim said, a mu'min knows the difference between wishful thinking and actual dua. What most Muslims do today is just wishful thinking. It's a wish. We grew up watching Disney cartoons. I wish, I wish, I wish. But it's not followed by action. A dua is followed by action. If you truly make dua to Allah, Allah forgive me for my sins. You will act in a way which shows that you are earning the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simple as that. So dua mandates action, follow up, which is the actions. So make sincere dua for your own community. We don't want troubles to come back we have moved forward alhamdulillah from january or december 2018 right we see ourselves we find ourselves moving kind of backwards and i'll let's remind when i came here alhamdulillah back in january uh, 2018 i moved here exactly on january 4th 2018 right it's been two and a half years subhanallah time flies and the brothers had requested that when I come, I come here for three years, right? At, 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 from the get-go, I don't go anywhere for three years. A lot of you don't know, and a lot of you do know, I did not come here for three years. I said, I will not sign the paper, you have to make it for only one year. I didn't sign anything for three years, never. I said, change it, I'll sign something for only one year, from January to December. Because I have, I'm a person, alhamdulillah, who lives by goals in life. I am very structured. When, when it comes to my own self, alhamdulillah, I try to be as disciplined and structured as possible. A masjid which has a lawsuit in the kuffar court, I'm not going to waste my time here. So I had a goal. 
a masjid, a house of Allah is in the court of the kuffar, this is a, I mean, embarrassing situation. I knew my intentions. I said to Allah, I thought, I'm just going to come here for one year. If I can help remove that lawsuit, if the people want me to stay, I'll stay. But a masjid that belongs in the court is not a masjid where I can teach. I don't want anything to do with that masjid. So I came here with a personal goal of just one year. So I came in January, Allahu Akbar, in October. Within 10 months, the lawsuit got dragged out of the court. We all came to a resolution. That's who I am. That's how I live my life. People forgot. The people who make trouble, you guys had a lawsuit for what? Three, four, five years? How come none of you could bring that lawsuit out of the court? Why? You love Allah's house so much, you couldn't get it out of the kuffar court? Regardless of what happens, who comes, who goes, I know why I came here. And inshallah ta'ala, I am confident that my Lord will reward me for that one job. Even if I don't achieve anything in life, I can meet Allah on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, I heard about one of your houses, which was in the kuffar court system. I did everything possible. And Alhamdulillah, with your help, I got it out of the court. I'm happy. I'm happy. That is how a Muslim is supposed to think. Right? Have goals. Be determined. This masjid belongs to Allah. Every Muslim has a responsibility. The responsibility is not to fight over titles. The responsibility is to learn our religion and worship Him. To raise the banner of La ilaha illallah. That's why we are here. To me, it doesn't matter who the president is, who's a shura member, who's not a shura member. My job is to teach the religion. And I have not stopped doing that. And inshallah ta'ala, will not stop doing that. You look what happened. COVID-19 lockdown. Some people were thinking, ah, our imam's going to go on vacation. They are the ones who are on vacation from Allah. They don't follow tawheed. They don't follow sunnah. They never come to learn. They're actually on a lifelong vacation from the deen of Islam. You think about it, brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, all by the, uh, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With the COVID-19 lockdown, every other night I gave you a lecture. Since Ramadan started, every single night there's a lecture. I still do the janazas. I still did marriages. I still do marital counseling. I still do youth counseling. What else am I supposed to do? Even when the world is locked down, these are the things I have been doing for your community. Why? Because I gave my life to Allah. That's what I love doing. I have no problem. So we are, inshallah ta'ala, have to be serious about our religion. Make extra dua that we do not go back to the fitna. I'm delivering a lecture every single night, every other night for the past two months. Because I don't have anybody around me. Oh brother, can I do a lecture? Will you help me? Will you bring food? Will you do this? Will you do that? And then they go backstab me and don't cooperate. And then there's nothing. I am my own boss in my own house. That's why I am able to teach what I, my purpose is every single night. I have no problem doing this at the masjid. And I did it. For a year and a half, we used to have five lectures in seven days. Why can't we go back to that? Why did things stop for the past one year? You should ask yourselves that. When the masjid reopens, I don't want to go back to a dead masjid. A masjid belongs to Allah. A masjid is for activities. A masjid is for us to teach one another to help one another, to counsel one another, not to make it dead. The graveyard is a place for dead. The masjid is supposed to be lively. So please, brothers and sisters, make sincere, utmost sincere dua during these last 10 nights. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save this community and make it a proper Muslim community where Allah either guides the troublemakers or Allah shuts their mouths and lets the, everybody else live in peace. So that's a personal uh, request from me to all of you. Because I would hate, I would hate to see any masjid of Allah go to the kuffar court for any reason. This is, I mean, we are really asking for serious trouble if we do this to Allah's house. So inshallah ta'ala, please, we sincerely hope all of us together, remember your community in the dua. Please. All right. So inshallah ta'ala, let's answer some questions and then we can call it uh, a night.
Just give me a little bit to scroll up. All right, so one hour. I think there was a question. Is it essential to move the tongue and lips while reciting Quran or can we recite in the heart? For any type of dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you make dua, whether you are counting subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, or you're reciting the Quran, this is an action of the tongue. So your tongue has to move. Uh, you don't just like look at the page. You have to move your tongue. So these are the actions of the tongue. You say, you recite the Quran. You say the dua. You say the dhikr, inshallah ta'ala. All right, let's see. One sec. I'm trying to answer the questions related to the topic first. Okay, where does the 83 come from? Is this 83? What What is the significance of 83? Oh, the 83. Alf means a thousand, right? Khairum min alf shahr. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the surah, that this night is better than a thousand months. So 1,000 months means 83 years and four months. So that's where the number 83 years came from. It has no, uh, uh, what's it called? Numerical special value to Allah, nothing of that sort. There's nothing magical about this number, none of that. It's just this month, is uh, this night is better than a thousand months, and a thousand months, of course, is uh, 83 years and uh, four months. Uh, four, uh, yeah, 83 years and four months. <clears throat> Is there an order for extra salah like uh, before Fajr or what is it? sorry, lots of questions popping up. So I'm trying to read and then it scrolls up. Is there an order for extra salah like before or after Fajr? I'm not quite understanding this question, Brother uh, Reynolds. So if you want to ask that again, what do you mean by if there's an extra or is there an order for extra salah? Okay, do you mean like if there are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is there any extra salah that's been ordered? Fajr is the only salah that's been ordered, the two units. That's the fard salah, right? This is the, uh, the prescribed salah. Before Fajr, from the sunnah, we have raka'atain, two units that are part of the sunnah. It's attached to Fajr. This is the sunnah of Fajr. And of course, before Fajr even starts, that's the best time to pray your night prayers, which is a maximum of 11 raka'at. Is wudu required to recite Quran from the mushaf? It is recommended, but not obligatory. So it's mustahab, meaning recommended, but it's not fard. So another question, same thing, is it required to have wudu to hold a mushaf? It is better if you do, but it is not uh, an obligation. After paying zakat and suddenly getting unexpected funding, do I have to pay zakat for that unexpected funding as well? You only pay zakat once the value has been there or the amount has been there for a whole year. right? So if you paid zakat today, tomorrow, by the qadr of Allah and an unexpected amount of money uh, came to your possession. You don't have to pay zakat on that until a whole year passes. If you still have that money left, that is, right? So a year has to pass. Can we open the masjid door for collecting donations on this Friday and on the last Friday? Yes, inshallah ta'ala again, um, this Friday from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock there will be uh, because some brothers were also already they already contacted me and the brothers from the management uh, they wanted to come because they didn't get the chance to drop their zakat al-fitr money as well as uh, money for the food that has been acquired and for any other regular donation so of course it's the last 10 days uh, be more generous the masjid will be open this friday as well and if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure because that's been the plan friday at the masjid saturday at eht so inshallah ta'ala both places will be open for you to jo donate generously. Friday 1 p.m. at the masjid and then EHT Saturday, same time. Uh, Sheikh, you bring up some important points in bettering ourselves in religion. 
the people who would benefit the most from what you say are not tuning in. How can we get the message across to them? Well, of course, uh, as the Prophet wasallam said, بَلِّغُ أَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً This is the hadith in Bukhari. Convey from me, even if it's just one verse, that you properly understand. Of course, don't just randomly start talking without proper knowledge and understanding. If you benefit, this is the way the deen is spread. If you benefit, you heard something beneficial, you know of someone who can benefit from the message of Tawheed, of Sunnah, of following the righteous ancestors. If you know that they will benefit, inshallah, or even if they don't, but you want to at least deliver the message, it's your job. And that's one way. Secondly, of course, which is even better, you practice the message and be a beacon of hope or a symbol, a role model for those around you that this is how you have to live by the message. So you have a responsibility. The listeners have a responsibility to implement it as well as pass it on. Don't you think by saying everything in Arabi, we are actually promoting the language Arabic, but the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said no Arab is greater than a non-Arab. Yes, that is an authentic hadith. The Prophet وسلم, said this in the Hajj on Yawmul Arafah, that an Arab is not superior to an Ajam, a non-Arab, nor is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. A white man is not superior to a black man, nor is a black man superior to a white man. This is the message, the universal of message of Islam, that Islam is not a place of racism. Islam does not tolerate racism of any kind. So national, nationalism, tribalism, uh, racism, all these other isms besides Islam is forbidden upon the Muslims. That's what he was talking about. As far as the language, without a doubt, the Arabic language is far superior than any other language in the world. Why? Because Allah spoke in Arabic and gave us the Quran. He's the one who created all these other languages. The Bengali, the Urdu, the French, the Chinese, the Swahili, uh, so many languages in the world. He created these languages. He gave the people these tongues. But he himself chose to speak in Arabic because of its uniqueness because of its richness. So we're talking about the language. So when it comes to the language, it is what it is. The Arabic language is more superior than other languages in the world. The language, we're not talking about the race. There's a huge difference between the Arabic language and the Arabic race. Islam does not promote racism. It's promoting the language because the Quran is in Arabic. Simple as that. Allah spoke in this language, therefore, it is superior to other languages. Like to check every morning for the signs if the previous night was Laylatul Qadr and having established it, they stopped standing the night. Okay, so there are some people, uh, this is, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, a point. Uh, the question reminded me of a point. This is a hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that the signs of Laylatul Qadr, you can see it the next day. The next day that, let's say, in the night of Laylatul Qadr, it is a night that is, إِنَّهَا صَافِيَةٌ بَلْجَةٌ It is a night that is pure and glowing. And it's like, كَأَنَّ فِيهَا قَمَرًا سَاتِعَ سَاكِبَةٌ سَاجِيَةٌ That it is bright, as if it were bright, tranquil, calm moon during it, as if it was uh, glowing, right? There, it's bright, there's a lot of peace that night. La barda fiha wa la harra. It's not overly cold, it's not overly hot. Something pleasant, the weather for that whole night. And uh, also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the same hadith that anna shamsa sabihataha takhruju mustawiyatan laysa laha shu'a'a. Uh, shu'a, that the sun appears in the following morning smooth, without rays. So how will you know if tonight is Laylatul Qadr, if you're sleeping and then you wake up in the morning and you look for the signs? You missed it, right? 
So the following morning, the sun rises without rays. It's just a smooth ring. No rays are uh, myth. And then the Prophet ﷺ actually emphasized even more to clarify. مِثْلَ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَدْرِ Just like the moon, when it's a full moon night, right? The moon doesn't have rays. It's just a smooth, glowing uh, object. So the sun the next morning is like that. Now, of course, if uh, someone is looking for this sign the, every morning, and then he sees, oh, okay, I see the sun glowing like this. So that means last night was Laylatul Qadr. All right, that's it. This is the way of the loser. Because the Prophet ﷺ who gave us these signs, of course, they looked at the sunrise after Salatul Fajr and all that. The Prophet himself made itikaf the whole 10 days. He didn't say, okay, Laylatul Qadr is over. Ma salam, I'm going back home. Nor the Sahaba said that or did that. So this is something that we have to follow through. Laylatul Qadr is one night. We understand that. But still, the nights of Ramadan are there. The days of Ramadan are there. You still have to fulfill Ramadan, complete Ramadan in the best way. Right? So this is what you have to think. Don't be from the losers who are always looking for shortcuts. And those shortcuts aren't, aren't really shortcuts to Jannah. But it kind of becomes a shortcuts to Jahannam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. People re never remember the good thing. May Allah grant you the highest place in Jannah. No, of course, this is, it's, it's, it's with everybody. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our sister Aisha brings this up. It's for everybody. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all, grant us. The main thing always remember, it's forget about people. It's not about people remembering or forgetting. As long as Allah, and Allah is of course a Lord that never forgets, right? So the main thing is you be a sincere Muslim, do what you have to do as a Muslim. Allah is recording, Allah is seeing, and inshallah, you will get your reward. So always uh, think about those things and do not give, uh, don't give up being uh, a sincere Muslim. What amal we should do at the period time of women? All right, so this is a good question from our sister Yasmin. If by the qadr of Allah, one of our sisters have their menstru uh, menstrual cycle going on during these last 10 nights. And of course, there's probably millions of women in that type of predicament at the moment. You can still read the Quran, especially in this day and age. There's, let's say, even if you were to say that there's ikhtilaf among the ulama uh, of whether you can hold the mushaf in your menses or not, even though I firmly believe you can, and there's enough authentic hadith for it, but that's a different uh, topic for another time. If there is a need, the woman has to uh, open the mushaf, grab it, read from it. When she is in her menses, no problem. But the dua, you can make dua. You can read the Quran from the smartphones, the computer screen, the tablets, your laptops, whatever it is. You can read the Quran from there. Even let's suppose that you follow the opinion that says you cannot hold the mushaf, right? Let's say you do. No problem. You can look at the screen and read from the screen. No problem with that, right? So regardless of what opinion you follow, there is a way out for you, inshallah ta'ala, that you can maximize. The only thing that a woman in her menses cannot do during these nights is, of course, the salah. And of course, in the day, she doesn't fast. So she can read Quran. She can make her dhikr, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu akbar. You can make your dua, no problem. So do all that, inshallah ta'ala. Basically, the salah will be the only thing that's missing. There's no sin upon you. Allah is the one who made you this way, so don't worry. Is it true that your salah will now be valid if there will not be valid if there is a picture in your room? It's not about whether the salah will be valid or not. The hadith in Sahih Muslim mentions if there are pictures hanging on the walls in your house, pictures of people or animals hanging on the walls of your house, whether there's a picture or dogs in the house, the malaika do not enter that house. Jibreel alayhi salam refrained from entering the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam until pictures or dogs would be removed. So there was something hanging on the curtains. It's, it's, it's almost looked like as if these are pictures, images hanging on the walls. The Prophet ﷺ was so angry. 
he ripped it down. So if Jibreel refuses to enter the house of Rasulullah, there is no way on earth any angel will enter my house or your house if we have pictures hanging on the wall. Simple as that. And this is the hadith in Sahih Muslim. So that's what the hadith talks about. If there's pictures, angels will not enter your house. Pictures or dogs. Now the issue of salah, is your salah invalid if you pray in a room that has uh, images? Your salah is not invalid, but there is a big possibility that you will have less reward. Because this is something that you should not be having in the first place. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's how we look at it. But will the salah be valid? Yes, inshallah ta'ala. May not be fully rewarded by Allah. Some parts will be missing in terms of reward. But pray, clean that out for all over the house. Whether you're praying or not praying, inshallah, you should not have pictures in your house. So another question from another sister, are women allowed to read the Qur'an when they are impure? By the, so inshallah, I already answered that, no problem. You can read, read it, make dua, make your dhikr. What is the punishment for breaking a promise? If you said, wallahi, you took an oath, this is the ayah from the Qur'an. You have to fast uh, fast three days to make up, do the kafara. That's your punishment. Fast three days when you break a promise. That's uh, Now let's, let's give an example here. Wallahi brother, I'm going to come tomorrow and help you move. By the qadr of Allah, you got sick. You couldn't come. Or something happened, the roads were blocked. You simply couldn't show up. That's an unforeseen circumstances by the qadr of Allah. That's not on you. But there was nothing stopping you from fulfilling that promise. You took an oath by Allah's name and you did not do it. This is a major sin. So you have to fast three days in order to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three consecutive days. Uh, I have a friend who I follow on Instagram. I know him well. He comes from a Muslim family, but he isn't practicing Tawheed, doing Saum. And instead, he is wasting his days doing Ramadan with his kuffar friends, doing haram things and saying foul things. Should I talk with him kindly to remind him as his religious roots? Or do I ignore him let, and let Allah determine his punishment? No, this, these are things, these are situations where you as a Muslim, you should talk to the brother. Remind him, this is Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. This is the whole concept that you command what is good and forbid what is evil. This is where you put it to practice in situations like this. So it is one of the characteristics of the Muslim that you tell the people about the good and warn them against the evil. So, you know, give him da'wah, give him da'wah, remind him. The only time when you would stop doing so is Allah forbid, while trying to talk to him, he is now negatively influencing you. You have to save your life first. So that's when you say, wait a minute, this guy, he's a little out of control. I can't actually help him. May Allah give him somebody else to help him. So you walk away. You don't break your own self trying to help somebody else. But if you see that inshallah ta'ala, you are fine, you are able to help, then you help that person. Also specifically, what is the punishment for taking a loan from someone and never giving the money back? Well, this is of course a punishment uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will determine, but this is from the sins. Uh, yeah, but Allah has also addressed the people who give out loans. Um, if for some reason the person who took the loan from you genuinely cannot return it, he is, Islamically speaking, this is a legitimate excuse. The person would have to analyze. The loan giver, if he has mercy upon the person, this is a reward for him. You, he will see this reward in Jannah. So when you give somebody a loan, there's a genuine situation. Let, let's say, let's, somebody comes to me and says, brother, I need $500 as a loan. I'll pay you back one week later. All right, no problem. I give him the $500. While he is going home, he gets robbed and somebody takes the $500. What, what what can I do here? It's not that he did not return it. Allah willed that neither me nor him benefits from that 500. What can I do? So the, I'm just giving, 
it can happen. It can happen. People get robbed. You know, people get robbed on a daily basis. But I'm just giving one example. Now, but of course, somebody comes and asks for a loan. His whole intention is not to give it back. And there are cheaters like that in the community, uh, everywhere. Uh, in, in our community, meaning not, so, not just our community. All over the world. That's what I meant, right? All over the world, there are people like that. That's different. That's a sinner. And uh, that person will be uh, accountable on the day of judgment for cheating somebody like that. But there is great reward that somebody give, takes a loan from you. You are not in need of the money. You are alhamdulillah well off. You have no need. That person is suffering. He's struggling genuinely. And he's trying. He's working. But he just genuinely cannot come up with the money. He's already struggling. Khalas. For the sake of Allah, you forgive. This will be better for you. Allah has praised those people who do so. Nobody but Allah knows what is in the hearts of people. But it seems that many in this community continue to plot and plan negative politics, trying to benefit themselves and harm the masjid. How can we prevail upon them to change their ways? It is, of course, again, we don't know what's in the hearts of people. But as the saying goes, and it's from Islam, actions speak louder than words. Someone doesn't have to say what's in their hearts. Their actions will show Allah exposes people's hearts through their actions and statements. This is from the uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and this is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. The, the wahi, the revelation died with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi We don't know what's in people's hearts. There is no way for us to find out who is a hypocrite, who is a mu'min, who is this, who is that. We don't have the means. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi has passed away. So what do we do now? Umar then explained to the people. We go by what is zahir, what is apparent in the person. If he speaks nicely, does nice things, alhamdulillah, he's a nice guy. What's in his heart is between him and Allah. It's not my business to dig behind. If he speaks evil and does evil, he's an evil person. We need to stop him. This is the way the Sahaba understood the actions and statements of people. That there are people clearly speaking to burn, to set the masjid on fire, people working to set the masjid on fire, well, guess what? What's in your heart is between you and Allah. But we will follow Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab in this explanation. And this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. We go by what is zahir. Innocent until proven guilty. This is from Islam. Don't think this is American law. That is the law of the Sharia. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. How do we find somebody is guilty? His words, his actions. That's it. So if he's evil, he'll say evil, he'll do evil. If he's speaking good, he's doing good. That means he's a good person. It's not our business to find out what's in his heart. You will, you will lose your mind if you're trying to figure that out about every human being. It's from Allah's wisdom that he made this rule. And Umar radiallahu anhu is the one who explained this. Is there any Qur'an khatam dua? There is no specific dua for uh, Qur'an khatam. But of course, you ask Allah, this is an ibadah that you did. Allahumma taqabbal minni. O oh Allah, accept from me. I finished the recital of the Qur'an. Or whenever you're reciting anything, you want to make dua to Allah for Allah to accept your recital. This is a general dua, no problem. All right, let's see. <clears throat> Let's not, we still, I still have a couple of more questions. Let's not, and no, any more new questions, don't type because it's already 10.30. I don't want to keep you guys for too long. If you already prayed Salatul Witr, can you still pray Tahajjud after that? Uh, no, uh, you should not do that. The Witr prayer is the last prayer. So if you prayed, and again, as we said in the beginning of Ramadan, the Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer, is prayed was prayed by the Prophet ﷺ in three different times. Sometimes he prayed right after Isha in the early parts of night, which is what we see people doing in Ramadan time, because it's easier for the whole jama'ah to come, pray the early part of the night, it's easier. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would pray the night prayer in the middle parts of the night. And sometimes he would pray in the last one third of the night, which is the absolute best time. Suppose you prayed your Qiyamul Layl, you finished your Witr by midnight tonight. 
You prayed Asha and right away you did that. No problem. You will get your reward for the night for Salah. Now from 12 o'clock until 4 a.m., until your sahur, when you start eating sahur, for the next four hours, read Qur'an, make some dua, take a little break, drink some water, eat some food, no problem, you want to take 10 minute gaps between to energize yourself, that is completely fine. You want to read an Islamic book, you want to watch a lecture, all of that is termed as ibadah. All of that is ibadah, brothers and sisters. So maximize the time. Utilize the entire time to perform the different types of ibadat. The salah, of course, is the most important. If you have done it, you have done it. Don't pray again after praying Salatul Witr. Witr is the last prayer for the night. Then you just wait for Salatul Fajr. All those who are watching right now, may Allah make them a source of knowledge for others. I mean, of course, a beautiful dua. We ask every brother and sister who is seeking the knowledge, who's learning, not just from me. There's alhamdulillah thousands and thousands of other uh, du'at, tulabul ilm, shuyukh, most of them better than me. Alhamdulillah, whoever it is that you listen to, as long as he's from Ahlul Tawheed and Ahlul Sunnah, benefit from their knowledge and uh, benefit others from what you learn from them. That's our civic duty as Muslims. We learn, we implement, and then we share. All right, one last question, and then we'll call it a night. What is special about the last Friday of Ramadan? Can we pray qaza for the whole year? There is nothing special about the last Friday of Ramadan. I know a lot of people might th say, oh, this is akhiri juma. It's just the Friday of Ramadan. There is no, there is absolutely nothing in our deen that says that the last Friday of Ramadan has any special barakah to it. All of Ramadan has more barakah than any other days and months of the year. The last 10 nights of Ramadan are at the absolute best. So there is nothing about the last Friday. And as well as, can we make qaza for the whole year? The concept of qaza making up I'm, I'm guessing the brother is asking about making up uh, the Salah. That concept does not exist in our Sharia. There's no hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, by the way, since you missed two years of Salah, now make them up. You have to make sincere tawbah. Uh, sincere tawbah to Allah and do not miss your Salawat. If it's within that same day, for, so for example, you missed Dhuhr for something, join the Dhuhr when you pray Asr, or it's Maghrib time, something happened, you were unable, like really severe situation happened, no problem, you can join Maghrib with Isha. For that day, it's fine, right? But you're talking about last week, you missed a Dhuhr, you want to make it up today, there is no such concept whatsoever in our Sharia. You would have to make sincere Tawbah and not miss the Salah. All right, inshallah ta'ala. So now, of course, uh, I'm not going to start uh, tafsir of a whole surah for the last uh, eight, nine nights. But what I'm going to do from tomorrow, every night, we will uh, select some verses from the Qur'an and we will discuss uh, that, inshallah ta'ala. Since Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an, I would like to stick with uh, lectures based on Qur'an instead of talking about a hadith or this or that. But of course, we discuss a hadith that's related to the ayah. But the overall theme will be verses from the Qur'an. All right, inshallah ta'ala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our uh, du'as, our salah, our re recitation, all our adhkar during these last 10 nights. And of course, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us strong and willed to maximize these last 10 nights bi-idhnillah. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.